Okay, so it's my great pleasure to introduce to you our today's speaker, so Jia Xinshi. So uh, we have been friends for a very long time, so busy since our PhD days, but uh, it's very nice to see him doing a lot of interesting uh, work within the field of machine learning. So if you work, have worked on anything like scores, uh, matching and uh, Gaussian processes, kernel methods, and also things related to like these state-based models, more or less, you might have uh, seen his paper. So, well, uh, it's very delighted to have you here. So, get on. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Injun, for inviting me, and uh, thanks everyone for coming. I've been never been so close to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, so, um, today I'm going to talk about uh, mask diffusion models for. Uh, discrete generative model. So this is a kind of uh, diffusion model for discrete data. And it's been there for a while in the in the literature, but uh, somehow, you know, people didn't figure out how to train and uh, use this model properly. And today I'm going to talk about a recent work that tries to sort of bridge this gap between, you know, the theory and practice of mask diffusion and um, how to make it really work. So, um, yeah, and um, let's get started. And so uh, um, we'll be focusing on the challenging of building discrete generative models, basically building uh, generative models for discrete data. So by discrete data, I mean uh, this, uh, I mean this kind of data that can be either counted or categorized, such as you know words in a sentence, or um, uh, more broadly speaking, any uh, digital representation, digital representation of any data uh, in your computer is actually discrete, even if they are inherently continuous, right? So um, our traditional approach to um, um, discrete generative modeling, and modeling this kind of data using generative models, and uh, such as our regressive models, they have some limitations. Uh, one big limitation of our regressive models is that um, uh, they have a sequential nature. Basically, you have to predict they predict this data token by token in order to generate them. So it can be very slow. So uh, this is where the idea of diffusion models came in. So in diffusion models, uh, the way you generate data is not token by token or in sequence in the sequential uh, order, but you actually generate the multiple tokens uh, in parallel. So this is why. Um, we're interested in uh, exploring diffusion models for discrete data. So that enables you to use this kind of parallel sampling. And here's one example of you know, generating a piece of text from our um, discrete diffusion model. And you could see that those tokens that are in the same color, they are sort of unmasked and generated at the same time. So it can be more efficient. Cool. The second reason uh, why we would want to study uh, discrete diffusion models is that um, uh, these models allow us to do to perform any other reasoning. So one of the big uh, motivation behind uh, studying these generative models is that we would want to uh, have these kind of models for our intelligent agents, such that the agent can perform reasoning or planning using these models as a surrogate for the real world. Right? And if you think about this kind of usage case, um, we would want such a word model to be able to reason in any directions. But however, if you think about, you know, these mainstream outer regression models, uh, especially those powered by large language models these days, um, these models are built to follow a fixed order. They are not like, you know, um, um, you can sort of apply these models to, to generate in any order. It, it basically just follows the left to right order. And Here's an example of a very simple text in filming tasks where you know you observe those purple uh, text and um, the model is asked to infill the text in between and it has to generate in a way such that these texts are coherent with each other. And you can see that discrete diffusion models can easily do this task while at the same time, if you want other regression models like language models to do this, you have to transform it into a left to right prediction problem, basically reformulating the problem as you know either prompting the model or um, other kinds of uh, uh, tricks you have to do but for this great diffusion model it's the most natural things to do this kind of inference. and the final reason of studying in this great diffusion models which is one of the um, uh, biggest motivation uh, my uh, my personal biggest motivation of studying this kind of models is that uh, it allows us to unify continuous and discrete modalities. And 
So one question you might ask, you know, having seen these arguments in the previous slides is that, you know, I know you don't want to use our regression models uh, for discrete data, but uh, um, for these kind of tasks, but uh, why not use continuous diffusions, right? Because you can always embed the discrete data into an embedding space and build a continuous diffusion model on top of the embeddings. And because of those embeddings are continuous and um, there shouldn't be any problem. It turns out that you know a lot of people have tried this, and uh, this all starts from uh, a work called CDCD from uh, my colleague uh, Sander. And uh, the, has since then there has been a lot of work that tries to improve this model, and some of the, the significant uh, improvement was made in 2014 by this paper called Played. And it turns out that the general imp impression of this kind of work is that the results, uh, in terms of measured by uh, the results measured by likelihood metric turns out to be uh, outperformed by their discrete counterparts. So these models are not so uh, good at the current moment compared to you know, running, uh, just running diffusions in discrete space. And um, the second reason, uh, um, on the other hand, you know, uh, discrete diffusions, uh, as we will show in this work, is that discrete diffusion models can actually work as well compared to continuous diffusion models on those inherently continuous data. So one of these models that we will be uh, focusing on in this talk is called mask diffusion model. And we will show later that this kind of model can actually allow you to model both discrete and continuous data. While on uh, continuous data, it actually works as well as continuous diffusion models. Cool. Hopefully, I have convinced you that you know, uh, discrete diffusion is a promising uh, direction to work on. And so uh, we'll, be, we'll be diving into this uh, particular formulation of discrete diffusion, which we call mask diffusion today. And the mask diffusion is also known as absorbing distribution. It was first proposed in this Austin paper in 2021. Um, and so uh, the basic idea is that considering we're given a, a set of uh, such, such as a sentence of tokens and or um, a uh, 24 uh, bit representation of images in computer or whatever you know disparate sequence you have in your computer, then uh, mask diffusion gradually introduces noise into uh, this data by randomly and independently replacing some of these tokens uh, with a special mask token. So it's going to do this uh, independently for each token and gradually eventually arriving at a state, where all the tokens are eventually masks, right? And this kind of process is defined by uh, specifying this masking schedule, alpha t, and whose meaning is the expected proportion of unmasked tokens at time t. So alpha t will then be a monotonic decreasing function from time zero to time one, and at time zero, everything is unmasked. So alpha t is one. That means you know there's the, there's no mask tokens at that moment. And at time one, everything becomes a mask. And the, uh, the alpha, there are many choices of this masking schedule, right? There you can follow this linear schedule, and you can also go you know fast, uh, slower at the beginning, and faster in the end, and you can do whatever you want as at last it satisfies this um, monotonic property. Cool. So in diffusion models, this kind of full lorazine process is often uh, called the forward process because it tries to sort of deconstructing, destructing the data into noise. So in the end, you get a full lorazine state. And so this forward process, although we have defined their marginal properties, basically we know that at time t, there are alpha t proportion of tokens that are unmasked. But we did not specify, you know, what exactly happens during this process. Like, for example, from time S to time T, how many tokens have changed from, you know, an unmasked state to a mask state, right? So it turns out that we can define this, you know, transition distribution to characterize the whole process very easily and making consistent with these marginal properties. So what we are going to do is basically we're taking any of these unmasked tokens and with probability alpha t over alpha s, we're going to um, keep that token unmasked 
with one minus its probability, we're going to change that token into a mask, right? And we do this independently for all tokens. So from time s to time t, we're going to follow this transition distribution. And if you are familiar with, sorry, I need to remove this such that you can see the... Hmm. Well, I guess I need to give up. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so this is a transition matrix, QST, and this is the form of it. Fortunately, the T components on our side. And so it has this structure, which is identity plus so rank one structure. And identity means that, you know, just stay here and remain on mask. And the rank one structure means that please go to the mask state, right? So you have two choices. Cool. And one of the key, uh, key idea of diffusion models is that given this forward loading process, we can actually reverse that process. By, our, by reversing this process, we get a generative model because we basically start from a full mask state and we gradually unmask the tokens according to the remaining context. And then in the end, we recover a sample which is very close to the data distribution, a sample from the data distribution, right? And we're going to do this in two steps. The first step is we're going to compute the transition distribution from time t to time s, assuming that we already know the ground truth data point x0. And because we have already defined the forward process from forward transition distribution from s to t, we can just apply a base rule and compute this probability distribution. And it turns out it's also very simple. So it basically says that with probability alpha s minus alpha t over one minus alpha t, we're going to unmask this mask token, right? And with one minus this probability, this mask token will still remain on, sorry, will still remain on mask throughout the process. But uh, if a token has already been unmasked, then we'll just replace it with the value x0, and that value will stay unchanged until the process ends at time zero, because it's a reverse process that goes from one to zero. And you can also you know, write it as a transition matrix and can I see it, but it's not important. Cool. And the second step is that if you think about the real generation process, the uh, we actually don't know what the ground truth is. We don't have access to the data because that's what we are trying to generate, right? So we'll have to perform a second step, which is to predict x0 given my current noisy state xt. And so uh, what I'm going to do is to go to look at what is x0. x0 is the representation of my discrete data. And because it's discrete, Usually we use a one hot representation of it. So you get zero, zero, zeros for the classes that it's not in and for the classes of this particular data, you put one there. And if you look at this zero, zero, one vector, then the mean value of that, the mean value of x zero given the current x, value xt is just the probability of x zero being in each different state, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to use a neural network that takes xt as an input and then output these probabilities over all the other categories. Sorry, all the categories. And we will use that to parameterize this backward generative model. And if you look at this uh, backward process, this reverse process, the only difference from the previous page is that we're replacing this probability here with the probability times the probability output from the neural network for each different class. Because now it's uncertain that which class it will be in. So I will use this prediction probability as my guess. And with that probability, I will unmask to state J. And what do you do in generation? In generation, for each of these mask tokens, I just look at you know, these two probabilities. And if, you know, I draw a uniform value, if it fell, if it is larger than one mass alpha S uh, over one mass alpha T, then I'll keep this mask token on a uh, mask. And with one mass that probability, if uh, 
then I will just unmask it. And how I'm going to unmask it depends on the output of my neural network. You know? And I will just draw one sample from this order of its classes according to the probability given by the neural network. <laughs> So just to make sure I understand, so once you uh, uh, unmask one patch or one pixel, then you will just remain unchanged for the entire process. Yes. Okay, so this is more or less like autoregress generation, but with this kind of probabilistic chosen uh, ordering. Exactly. Okay. I'll talk about that connection later. But that's a very good point. Um, yeah, so uh, usually we call this this model parameterization here, this mu theta in the neural network here, as a main parameterization. And this is sort of uh, trying to align with what people do in continuous diffusion models, where you know you also have a prediction model for x zero, and typically there are two different parameterizations that people do. One of them is predicting x zero, the other is predicting the score or the noise you added to that beta x zero. So um, this is trying to sort of align what we do in discrete diffusion to what people are used to in continuous diffusion. Okay. Um, once we have questions, question. um, for, for the data, you chose a matrix. But why is that? Like if in, for an image, you have a two dimensional matrix, but why is it not a vector, for example? Like for text, there's no spatial dependency of up and down, right? So. There's no, but this process, this is just an illustration for, yeah. for confusion, but you can also put the vector here and it doesn't matter because you are, we are looking at these tokens independently. So, so the, yeah, it's just to, to work, to work. So it's, it just shows something randomly. There's not a specific reason why it's two dimensional. No, no, there's no, yeah. It's just a random chosen image here to show that, you know, we can work on to the data. Well, once we have defined the model, then the next thing is quite straightforward. Like we're just going to follow the standard recipe in machine learning, which is to perform maximum likelihood learning. You know, given some data x zero, and my model with parameters theta, I'm going to maximize the likelihood. And I'm going to do this by using the standard variational inference lower bound, where we just lower bound this log probability of x zero by um, introducing um, inequality, and this inequality is introduced by measuring the differences between my forward and the reverse process. The reverse process is our model, right? It's not the true reverse process of my forward process. So basically, this objective is like, you know, um, minimizing the difference between my forward process and my backward process. And we try to make them the same, such that, you know, when you run the backward process, you are able to generate this data. And this is what people do in continuous diffusion models as well. Like you have the elbow the evidence lower bound in the same inner form. And this x e1 to x e is actually the time you choose to discretize this process. Say I'm going to look at this process at time one, t1, time t1, t2, and until t b e. Right? And all these states are latent states because they're stochastic. We don't know what they exactly are. We only know the data. So we're going to sort of infer them using this forward process. And then we're going to uh, maximize this objective in order to learn the model. And as I said, this is the same as what people do in continuous diffusion models. There's no real differences in the, in the objective. But it turns out that um, when previous works on discrete diffusion does this, like they all look at the elbow the same as us, but they sort of overlook the fact that this elbow can actually be greatly simplified if you just put all the analytic formula that I showed in the previous slides into the computation here. And if you do that computations for the KL divergence, since this uh, backward distribution and this model all has this very simple logic of two branches as I showed, then everything simplifies uh, if you compute them analytically, and they even simplifies further if you push that number of latent variables, the, the different time steps that I'm going to look at into infinity. So I'm going to look at all the times through zero to one. And then the final objective will become very simple. It will become this integral over a weighted cross entropy loss. Question? Yeah. Um, 
So you're in the field divergence, we're trying to minimize the basic is probability distribution of unmasking the tokens with that of masking the tokens, right? Yes, this is uh, how the, sorry, I, I skipped it a lot because I assume, you know, um, continuous diffusion models are actually quite popular these days, but this is like, you're right that we're actually looking at um, forward, the, the cal divergence between forward distribution and the backward distribution. But if you check it carefully, it's actually looking at the reverse of the forward process and the backward generation models. It's from T to S. Oh yeah, because that's the so question. Like what test. happens? Because the probability distribution of unmasking is not the same as the one as masking. It's it's reversed. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's basically the idea of this objecting. And yeah, and as I said, like if you push time to infinity, and if you synthesize above, then what you're getting the end is this loss. And if you look at it carefully. The rhythm is just integral over zero to one over time. And you have this coefficient, which is determined by the schedule, masking schedule alpha t. And the second term uh, can be estimated, estimated by first drawing a sample xt, which is a loyalty state from your data x0. And if this loyalty state is a mask, so this is why this delta is here, then I'm going to predict the x0, I'm going to predict the value of x0 using my neural network prediction model, and it will give you the probability for each different classes. And then I'm going to compute the cross entropy loss between the true x0 and the prediction given by my network, right? And this is just the standard classification loss used by everyone, you know, if you do a classification test. But the only difference of training such a generative model is that you have to integrate it over time. And that's a final object. And we can actually look at what this weighting function are like um, for different kinds of masking schedules. So here I had the same plot from previous slides. So I have you know, linear uh, geometry and cosine schedule, and also polynomial schedules. And they all correspond to different kinds of weighting you put on the cost entropy losses for the time between zero and one. But they all sort of share the similar property that you know this weighting will sort of decrease from time zero to time one. Sorry, it's negative value, so it's actually decreasing in magnitude magnitude. And for that, this seems very sensible because if you think about time zero, where you have no masks, it'd be very easy to predict the true value, right? Because if you already know what the true value is because there is no noise. And at time one, everything is a mask. It's basically very hard to predict what x is zero is. So this loss, this cross entropy loss, will be very high at this end and be low at this end. And this weighting is basically sort of like balancing between this scale of the cross entropy losses, such that you know this value of the product does not change much, and which sort of plays a role of minimizing the variance of this. Um, um, this objective function if you try to estimate it by sampling the time t between zero and one question. Yeah, I was wondering, um, so this is an integral uh, over the whole process. Uh, do you, would you normally approximate this with like a uniform, like by uniform sampling t or you know, using a different distribution? Yes, so that's a good question. So in this work, we didn't explore much about that. We just take the uniform distribution between zero and one and estimate it by one call. Okay. And I guess a follow up. So I was recently working on um, discrete flow matching, and the loss is kind of similar, I guess. It's the same. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. I mean, flow <laughs> matching is <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And um, having seen the objective, and I feel like this is one of the most interesting part of this work that hasn't been so uh, well perceived by people is that we under this simple masking formulation of model, one thing you can do is that you can um, impose some of these knowledge you have about the generation process, about the data actually. So in some of the data we're dealing with, the discrete tokens, the different kinds of states for the discrete tokens, they're not very equal. Like sometimes, you know, you want to generate one type of tokens earlier than other type of tokens. 
And that means this type of tokens are more important in the part of the data. And it turns out that we can do this easily in this framework by just making the probability of masking a token mm -hmm. in a forward process to depend on the token value. So how, do, how are we going to do this? And it's mostly straightforward if you look at it from the transition rate, transition matrix um, structure. So this is our transition matrix, forward transition matrix from time S to T. And it has this you know, identity cross rank along structure. And the coefficient here is just a, a scalar, right? So because we have a scalar schedule, which is uh, from zero to one, um, mapped from zero to one to zero to one. So uh, what we're going to do is to uh, we're changing this masking schedule from a scalar value function to a vector value function. It's going to take V outputs, and V is the size of the possible states this discrete data can take. So it's the size of a vocabulary if you're applying for text. So uh, if we do this in this transition matrix, we can change it accordingly from the scalar coefficient to a diagonal matrix where each row has a different coefficient R by T. And with this, you can easily learn a different schedule for different type of token values. And one bad news is that if you do this and try to derive the elbow function for this particular transition matrix, it gets a bit complicated in discrete time. And if you write it out, it's very complicated and it's very hard to implement it in a numerical stable way. But the good news is that if you push, again, push the time to infinity, and this loss function, this elbow, for the particular state-dependent schedule model, it will have this very simple form. Oh, no, it's, um, yeah, and still we can see a bit. I will, I will, I will read through it. So the first part, the coefficient is the same, but now it becomes a vector because R for T is a vector. And so when you take the product, it's no longer a scalar product, but it becomes an inner product. And there is an insight it's great that this, this part is masked because if we only look at this part, it's just a cross entropy, the same cross entropy model, but multiplied by a vector x0. And what is this thing? This is just the difference between x0 and your neural network prediction, mu theta. And everything else remains the same. So if you, if you think about this objective, it, you can actually see that it reduces to the MD4 loss. Sorry, I should have introduced the previous loss function. Its name is as MD4. I think we call it mask disparate diffusion for disparate data, thus MD4. And the difference between this loss function and the MD4 loss is that, sorry, this loss will, it's not a difference, but this loss will reduce to MD4 if your R for T is a scalar times all one vector. Basically, if I choose this vector value function such that all of its output are the same, like they share the same schedule, all the token values that share the same schedule, then you can show that this objective will reduce to your previous loss. So it's a strict generalization of the previous one. And you can see that very easily by just plugging R for T times the all one vector into this uh, coefficients and multiply that through the left, uh, through the right hand side. These two terms will cancel with each other. This will disappear, and then it will cover the original loss. So that summarizes the two loss functions that we're introducing today. So one of them called it JMD4, and this generalized version we call it JMD4. And let's go and see some results. So uh, we are trying to evaluate this kind of discrete diffusion model, this mask diffusion model, on um, both discrete data, inherently discrete data, such as text. We're also evaluated on inherently continuous data, images. So we're going to look at text first. So what we do first is by training a GPT-2 scale model on open web text. And we're going to evaluate this model by calculating the zero shoot unconditional perplexity of this model on five benchmark data sets used by the GPT-2 paper, right? So this basically, this value basically tells you how likely is mask, this mask diffusion model uh, going to generate the natural uh, text from the five data sets. So we present 
they represent different source of uh, information. And you can see that um, our MD4 model is actually better than the previous best uh, discrete diffusion model on this task, uh, all five tasks. And it's better than the continuous diffusion model, which is known as plate, uh, and trend on the uh, embeddings of the, of the tokens. And it's even better than uh, GPT-2 checkpoint uh, of the same uh, size uh, network on four out of the five tasks. It's important to note that this is not a direct comparison because the GPT-2 checkpoint is actually pre-trained on web text instead of open web text because we don't have access to web text. So uh, it's not directly comparable, but it does show that this model has a very good quality as among these size of models. And if you further scale this model, if you do the medium size, GPT do medium size model, and we were able to actually keep this trend. Well, only slightly outperformed by I think on one of the tasks. And one might ask, you know, like uh, the evaluation here is kind of tricky because you train your model on open web text, but evaluate it on five other data sets which is what GPT-2 paper does, but it does raise a question whether your model is well-trained or worse-trained. And if your model is worse-trained, it might still be able to you know, become better on other datasets other than the dataset you train on, right? So we're going to answer this question by this slides. Basically, we uh, separate out some open web text validation sets from the original training set, and we're going to evaluate the perplexity of the model on this validation set, which is uh, data from the same distribution. So you can see that this results basically confirms that our model and before and gen before actually needs to better perplexity on the same data distribution. The model is better trend and compared to C, the previous best discrete diffusion model on this task and the Gaussian diffusion on the embeddings. And there are two messages from this table uh, and the figures that are mentioned that are worth mentioning. So one of them is uh, the discrete diffusion model actually outperforms the continuous diffusion model on embeddings, which is something I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and this outperforms it by a quite large margin. And the second message is that if you look at this figure, the training curve, the loss curve of the uh, seat of the previous uh, discrete diffusion model uh, is kind of uh, functionality. The reason why uh, this training is unstable is that also revealed in our work is that training with this goal parameterization used in the seed work is unstable due to the inconsistency of forward and backward processes. Um, I don't have time to go into that specific detail today, but you're welcome to check the paper for the explanation of why this is the case. And we also established the connection between this work and C, and showing that we are actually the main parameterization counterpart of the score parameterization used in that work. Any questions up to now? Cool. And one benefit of running JM default compared to M default, actually one additional benefit, because we have already seen one benefit, which is that you can get better perplexity. One additional benefit is that we actually learn the different schedule for the tokens such that we know we can actually have a look at these schedules for each different type of tokens and see what the model prefers to use, what the model prefers to generate uh, first compared to other tokens, right? And the way we do this is by choosing a masking schedule uh, for each token type i as one minus t to the wi. And wi is a free parameter that is learned by the model by maximizing the likelihood. And wi is a positive number. Um, so with a larger wi, this, process, this uh, schedule actually uh, decays slower compared to the smaller WI. And it means that if you look at the plot of the schedule, if the schedule goes slower at the beginning and faster in the end, if you reverse it, it means that the tokens are likely to be are more likely to be unmasked first. So we plot out uh, all the tokens 
uh, token types with the largest Ws learned by the model. And you can see that the model actually prefers to generate end of text first, so knowing where I'm going to end. And then it goes to generate all the punctuations after that. And then start doing some random things I don't understand. This is from the <laughs> tokenizer. And, but we can also look at, you know, those tokens the model prefers to generate in the end. There's not so much, you know, uh, signal here, but there's, there's, there's actually one word that you can sort of make sense of it, which is diligently. It's, it's a kind of word that, you know, you can put it anywhere without changing the meaning of the sentence. So that's what probably why the model wants to generate its name. Okay, as I promised at the very beginning, is that we're going to show some results uh, on images, uh, which is inherently continuous and show that uh, discrete diffusion can work as well. And we actually uh, conducted experiments on both super 10, which is, you know, machine learning standards and the larger scale builds that are image net 64 by 64. And if you look at the results we get, it's quite impressive. We compared to previous discrete distribution models, we vastly improved the results on Clipper 10. And it brings down the, uh, this is the bits per dimension, which is a normalized likelihood metric show. Again, it shows how likely the model is uh, to generate the test data, which is real images. And you can see that uh, our model is basically better than all the previous discrete diffusion results on this test. And also, it's going to outperform the best algorithm models on this task, the best reported results of algorithm models on this, um, on this task. And more impressively, like I think this model achieves better performance using less parameters. So 28 million compared to 59 million. And we look at the literature and didn't find any results uh, that scales disparate diffusions beyond 32 by 32 CFR images. So this is, these are all the results in the literature. So we actually go a step further and try to scale it a bit. And we go to 64 by 64 and train on ImageNet. And so there is no disparate diffusion baseline anymore because no one tried to do this before. But we can compare it with continuous diffusion and algorithm models. And if you compare it with algorithm models, the best results that you can find in literature on this is Perceiver AR. This is a model in 2021, I think. And it has four times more parameters than us, but still the likelihood uh, metric, the bits per dimension mentioned we get is the same level. And if you compare to continuous diffusion, the best results that we could find a few months ago is um, racial diffusion models. And you could see that our model is also the same, uh, achieves the same bits per dimension with racial diffusion models. So that concludes. Um, I hope that provides sufficient evidence for my uh, claim that you know discrete diffusion can actually perform as well as continuous diffusion models um, inherently continuous state. So having seen many likelihood results, the final thing we're going to talk about is to how to do real generation from this model. So how do we sample a real image uh, after we train the model? And it turns out there's one particular choice in a model that plays a very important role here, which is a masking schedule. And you can actually uh, achieve much better results by using a cosine alpha t schedule compared to a linear alpha t schedule. And this brings down, you know, the this is a metric of sample quality called FID, and we do it on ImageNet. You can see that a cosine schedule brings down the FID from almost 70 to 18 um, on using the same number of steps, 256. Wait, previously you said alpha t needs to be a monotonic function, right? Yeah. Okay, what is this cosine schedule? So here's the visualization. Get rid of this. So here's the visualization of the cosine schedule, which is a green one. It's not cosine if you look at it directly, but it's cosine if you flip it. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, there is a history reason why this is called cosine because. 
you know, um, in some work, this one, this time is called one, and this. Is oh yeah, yeah, okay. Cool. And we're so we basically we're trying we're interested in understanding why you know cosine schedule actually gives you better results, right, in terms of sample quality. And if you think about uh, how many tokens I'm going to unmask in this whole generation process in this ImageNet example, it's actually 64 by 64 by three. I think there are three different channels. So it's almost 10,000 tokens to unmask. And if you look at you know how many tokens and then um, unmask during the generation process using different schedules, you can see an interesting difference between the linear schedule and cosine schedule. The linear schedule basically do this uniform like at every step, like it's almost the uh, unmask around 50, 50, sorry, 40, 47, 48. Um, that number of tokens, but for cosine schedule, the number of tokens unmasked actually gradually grows from zero to almost 80. And if you think about this, it's kind of sensible because as the masking schedule makes use of the um um makes use of the redundancy in the image, right? At the beginning of the generation process, there is no token, there is no uh, unmasked tokens and there's no information, and you unmask very slowly to avoid introducing any conflicts between the tokens. If you generate two pixels that have, you know, very different colors, uh, but they are very close to each other, then it might only make sense in those ages instead of being a lot of regions in the image, right? So you don't want to do this very often. So at the beginning, what you prefer is to unmask one by one or very, very slowly or two by two. Or, so basically you want to do it very slowly such that having unmasked one token, I already know that this is green. And so I wouldn't want to uh, unmask something that is conflicting with that. Uh, and I want to do this uh, very carefully at the beginning, but after a while, I have more information in my image. I already unmasked a lot of pixels. So I can guess what this image is. And starting from then, like I can unmask a lot because everything else seems to be mostly determined given the pixels that I've already unmasked. And that wouldn't affect you know, the quality of the samples because uh, basically all the others are determined and I just need to predict them. And the order doesn't matter. I can just do it in parallel. Mm -hmm. And it's unlikely to introduce any complex questions. Do you have the um uh the things like uh in uh, I mean uh when for the generation distribution is is that a um independent distribution over each uh each pixel or is it do you um model it as a joint distribution or if when when you predict a uh, two Unmasking distribution at the same time? That's a great question. So the model is factorized uh -huh. if you look at it in continuous time. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because no matter how fast your unmasking is, like at a single time, there's only one token being unmasked. I see. I see. Yeah. So, um, but in, when you discretize a model, actually, when you run this generation process in finite number of steps, you have to discrete time between zero and one. Right. If it discretize into 256 steps, and in one of these small uh, periods of time, there are actually many tokens unmasked. So that's where this conflict comes from. Uh -huh. In a continuous time process, like everything is one by one. So there is no complex because you have already observed all the others before you unmask one token. It's more likely you are doing simultaneously. But it's your model that predicts uh, the generation in one step. Do you use uh, uh, models that have uh, approximation of uh, independence for each? Uh, so the model is factorized by itself. And the model is defined by factorized it's distribution. Defined. But this factorized distribution is correct. Like the true distribution is also factorized if you look at it in continuous time. Ah, I see. Yes. So that's where, you know, the, um, the um, difference uh, in 
generation and the model formulation is that in generation, you can't do the continuous time thing. You have to do it one by, sorry, you have to do it in discrete time. So that's why we're, these additional conflicts are introduced into the model. Ah, yeah. Thank you. Cool. And I think, oh, forgot to mention that if we make this model class conditional, like the um, pink, uh, pink uh, bar plot, you'll see that uh, the, we can further bring this FID down to almost uh, six. And we're aware that this, this is still behind, you know, the state of our continuous diffusion model um, sample quality, but it's important to note that here, like our objective function are designed for optimizing likelihood instead of sample quality. And if you are familiar with continuous diffusion models, this is kind of um, things where things makes a difference because if you train the model by elbow by likelihood, then you turn turn out to you you, you tend to get uh, worse likelihood compared to train the model by a weighted objective that sort of optimizes for sample quality mode. Okay, so just show some of the generations from the model, and this is from the model. Unconditional model with FID number around 80, and this is from a conditional model with FID number around seven. And although you know it's not like super uh, high quality compared to you know the state of art continuous diffusion model generation these days, you can see that it's already there. Like you have very clear foreground and background, and the objects are globally coherent. So it's it's there. Okay, so the last, uh, the last uh, uh, results I want to show is to show some of the conditional generation capabilities of this kind of model. As I showed in the beginning, this model is able to do these uh, any order in filming tasks. And here's uh, what happens if you apply it to text. I'm giving this uh, text in blue and we're going to generate some text after it or before it. Um, and you can see that um, uh, we also uh, showed the uh, linear schedule and the cosine schedule and try to compare them. And it's very interesting because there is no sort of quantitative, very established quantitative metric when you are trying to evaluate the quality of text samples. But you can actually see the difference uh, by just eyeballing it. Like the rate skydiving is a fun sport, but it's pretty risky. It's good. Now it starts, you are getting it's one to get last one for, you know, it starts to be nonsense. But if you read the cosine schedule, skydiving is possible, but extremely risky. You can have so many injuries one time and then one next time. There's so many ways you can get hurt. So it's like much better. <laughs> and the same happens uh, uh, when I try to do this backward in filming. I was trying to infill some text before it. And I'm trying to ask the model to provide a reason why I always shampoo twice a day and shower three times a day. But you know, uh, if you ask a cosine schedule model, it tells you that because your skin is a chemical solution that protects it from bad areas and spots at home within it, which kind of makes sense. But the linear schedule is saying, I'm just going to do this. I don't ask you why. <laughs> cool. Okay, so last point is having seen all of these results. Uh, it's very important to put this work in the right position in the literature because there are just so many work on diffusion models, continuous diffusion models, discrete diffusion models. And so how are we, what's the position of us in, in the literature? So we give three different interpretations of the MD4 uh, work, uh, MD4 objective in literature. Um, and we can view it first as a VDM version of this European, if you are familiar with both works. But if you're not familiar, that's uh, no problem. Uh, you can think of this model as a continuous time version of the 3 pm with a lot of simplification of the model objective, eventually turning it into a weighted cross entropy loss. And this is if simplification is the most important in terms of making the performance grow, because in the end, all that matters is numerical stability. You know, like if you look at how the 3 pm is going to implement the loss, it's based on this uh, KO divergence implementation, and they, they didn't realize that this objective can be simplified into cross entropy. And the way they implement this by introducing a lot of epsilon, like one to the, uh, sorry, yeah, one, 10 to the minus eight, like everywhere in the code, and that blows up everything. And 
Uh, we sort of believe that's one of the reasons why uh, this thing doesn't work. This redistribution doesn't wasn't shown to to work at that moment. Um, while the continuous time formulation does add some, you know, uh, improvement um, uh, above the discrete ones because it's a tighter bond, but it's not as you know as significant as what the simplification thing induces. Um, and also, one evidence that you know this RPM didn't realize is that the objective elbow objective is a way to cause entropy loss. Is that actually introduces an auxiliary, auxiliary cross entropy loss to their objective function? So basically, they take the sum of the elbow and the cross entropy loss, and yeah, and at that time, like it's all unclear. Okay, so the second one uh, work that is pretty important in the history of this distribution model is this Campbell paper, where they introduced also the elbow from the continuous time Markov chain perspective. And in, in the in a relative work section, we're actually uh, looking to like what exactly is the difference. We show that you know Campbell requires multiple neural network paths to do the estimation. Basically, the objective is a doubly stochastic objective. Uh, it, it has a sum inside of the objective where you have to do another non-colonial to estimate it, which has very high variance. And the reason why they need to do this is that their objective is actually an adaptation of ours by applying a discrete integration by part, which sort of changes the order of the sum, such that makes it more, um, uh, uh, which is, makes it more uh, difficult to, to estimate because you need to do the sum inside of the, of the integral. And so the last thing um, is uh, compared to this very late, latest, uh, very, uh, uh, so sort of the state of our results achieved by this uh, score entropy discrete diffusion paper. And we can think of this work just as a mean parameterization counterpart of it, because that work basically introduces a score parameterization of the discrete diffusion model. And interestingly, like if you are familiar with mean and score parameterization in continuous diffusion models, this work. Um, shows that you know in discrete diffusion score parameterization actually is worse than mean parameterization, which is sort of contrary to what happens in continuous diffusion. And the reason why it is worse, as I said in, in the experiment section, is that it breaks the consistency between full and analogous process. But I will not go into the details, and feel free to check out the paper and the related work section to figure out all these. Okay, and there are again two concurrent work is men worth mentioning that. Um, there are two concurrent papers that does similar things as this work, as we put it out. And the first work derives the same objective function as MD4. Uh, however, it does not have the generalized version. And the second work talks about the connection between the main parameterization and score parameterization uh, in discrete diffusion models. And both are sort of overlapping with us. And finally, um, these are the takeaways. Um, so I'll uh, have so talked about mass diffusion models, which we believe is a promising candidate for word models that can reason in any modality or direction. And MD4, MD4 for example, uh, this is these two different formulations make this kind of learning very simple, very performant, and also scalable. And our work also provides a new perspective on discrete diffusion and this any order generation methods. Basically, the masking schedule is now a new degree of freedom that enables effective parallel sampling if you think about the difference between the cosine schedule and the linear schedule. And this is a paper, I feel free to check it out. And uh, I also put the slides on my website so you can find it there. And this work cannot be possible without all my amazing collaborators. Thanks. Hey, I guess uh, because uh, later on this room will also be occupied, but we have uh, probably a few minutes for quick questions if we have. Okay, this uh, speaker is also going to stay for a while, I believe. Okay, but uh, if you have any quick questions. Let's just go back to the generalized version of your MD4. So in that version, you actually learn a learnable for process, right? So is it possible to have a fewer uh, time step if you have a Learnable follow-up okay. to have faster generation state. That's a that's a very good question. I think um, one challenging of having this generalized formulation is that the backward discretization becomes more difficult because you don't really know how fast the uh, each different type of tokens are going to be unmasking in this discrete is this small uh, discrete grade that you have. 
So you'll have to balance all of them such that you don't do the crazy thing, which is like, I'm going to unmask everything to be a space value for a end of text at the very beginning, because that's the only token that is supposed to be unmasking that region. So you have to discretize it very carefully such that at this time, and this particular token wouldn't be all unmasked, but some of them will just be unmasked and in the, with the right proportion. And we did this when we generate uh, with a generalized uh, version of MD4. And it's an interesting open question how we can do it faster with a generalized formulation. Then do you have any indication what is the possibility to have a learn and write just a few fewer steps? For the double, like yeah. as in the beginning, the fusion they have a multiple times the. It's a very diff. Uh, it's very interesting and also difficult question for discrete diffusion. One of the challenging is that because your final step is absorbing, it's like it's a, a deterministic state, and it's actually impossible to learn a one step jump from that absorbing state to build a generative model because everything will be deterministic. Then there is no stochastic laws, and it wouldn't form a distribution. But I think there are do uh, there there are indeed other directions for improving the generation speed, uh, which is like introducing uh, correctors and corrections for the um, conflicts basically generated by smaller discretization, um, sorry by large discretization steps. Um, so uh, there is already papers you know and follow ups out in archives these days. And if you check it, like you will see all kinds of correlations introduced in each step of the discrete diffusion generation. And instead of the factorized one, we're doing this work. Like people use, you know, energy-based models, uh, copulas, and uh, GANs, right? Like all kinds of ways of introducing correlations into each step. And that should accelerate the uh, generation process a lot. Okay, we can accept one more question. Uh, yeah, so it seems your model is like highly dependent on like the, the schedule you did at the beginning. So I was wondering if you like, uh, if you have, do you have any plans like removing this like parameterization, like it's highly dependent on it? Because it seems to me that like uh, perhaps it might work like for different data, but like uh, qualitatively at least you showed on the, the images as well. It, uh, it, it just fails sometimes under specific specific schedules. I think I think in the end, like we would like to figure out you know what's optimal schedule, but it also depends on the data distribution. Like for example, for the images, it's clear that the cosine schedule is among the among the current choices of schedule is the best. But we do not really know if it is the best for text, for example, like because we don't really have good quantitative uh, evaluations of the sample quality at the moment. Um, I think it's um, I believe I personally believe that this mas best masking schedule is actually data dependent. And the best way that you could achieve that is to learn that schedule from your data distribution. But it's unclear how we can do that uh, um, in a very effective way, because currently, like we also learn the schedule for the generalized version of MD4. Mm -hmm. But the good news there is that the number of parameters you have to learn is very, very small. Like it's just, you know, the size of the vocabulary and that's it. And, but if you want to learn more flexible things, then it becomes more difficult because there is one small thing that people didn't really didn't notice when they started working on it, but then they will notice that, which is that to learn the schedule, you have to back propagate you know, the discrete variables generated, which is the QXT given X variable distribution, and XT is discrete. And in order to train this model, you have to back propagate through that discrete generation. And that becomes a sort of a challenge. And I guess, you know, if you have worked on any of these discrete data variable models like VAEs and there's a whole bunch of papers that will come discrete gradient estimation. And I think that's another open research question to address. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Okay, thank you very much.